It's one of the reasons I, I love living in Olympia. It's, it's one of the most beautiful places to live because of Capitol Lake. You know, I've been around the waterfront for 50 years. This is a recreational paradise down here. It was born out of a landscape architect's dream, developed on the hubris of what man can do to overtake nature. This is the head of Puget Sound. It looks nice from the air or maybe up on the hill, but there's nothing else that comes from it. You can't use the lake. It's illegal to be inside of it. It collects invasive species. It collects pollutants. Constant water quality standard violations. I don't know of another city with the same circumstances as this, restoring estuary and habitat. And that's what we're gonna have right in our downtown. We're really worried about the amount of sediment that could come out of the lake. If you don't dredge, uh, most of these boats are gonna disappear. Recreational boating has been a part of Olympia's history since the beginning. So now you won't have a boating waterfront, you'll have a mud waterfront. I'm not sure how it's gonna impact the beauty of this particular scene that they created when they made this lake. Initially, the biggest concerns were about the smell. This wasn't a knee-jerk reaction. And we take pride in, in being a, a, a green state, and yet right here we have something that is absolutely against everything we supposedly stand for. It just doesn't make sense to us. What are those people going to do? In the 1920s, stonemasons put the finishing touches on the centerpiece of the Washington State Capitol, the legislative building. 170 million pounds of stone, steel, and visual appeal. The Capitol building is capped at 287 feet by the largest masonry dome in the United States. Inside hangs the largest Tiffany chandelier in the world. The legislative building faces the massive Temple of Justice, which houses the Washington Supreme Court. The complex is perched on a bluff overlooking Capitol Lake, and beyond it, the Puget Sound, framed by the mountains of Olympic National Park in the distance. Capitol Lake has been part of the view and the city of Olympia for more than 70 years. The 260-acre lake stretches from the downtown Olympia waterfront on one end to the historic Tumwater Falls on the other. Designs for the state capitol called for a reflecting pool below the bluff to complete the view. In 1951, the completion of the Fifth Avenue Dam created Capitol Lake by severing the connection between the Deschutes River and Bud Inlet, the southern tip of the Puget Sound. Since then, the local salmon have relied on a fish ladder to get past the dam. Capitol Lake is the first and the last stretch of their lifelong journey from river to ocean and back. Every year, people gather to watch the impressive salmon defy the current to reach their spawning grounds on the Deschutes River, the place where they were born. For the Chinook salmon, that's the state-run fish hatchery at Tumwater Falls, just upstream from the southern edge of the lake. The coho salmon are sorted out and released back into the river to reach their spawning grounds further upstream. The falls are the site of the first pioneer settlement on the Puget Sound, and also the original brewery that made Olympia famous for its beer. It's the water, the natural artesian water here, when you want a really good tasting beer. Parks were developed on both sides of Capitol Lake with spacious lawns, wide running paths, and quiet benches in the shadow of the state capitol. The lake's prominence and proximity to points of interest make it popular with visitors. Locals flock to the pedestrian pathways and parks on lunch breaks and weekends. Kathy Dryblatt is a regular. I do love the lake and it's really important to me and I use it all the time and it's a treasure that doesn't, is beyond value for living here in Olympia. I mean, I wouldn't be happy in Olympia without it. <laughs> to Kathy, Capitol Lake is an escape. The spot to meet with friends, stretch her legs and blow off steam. Under the surface, problems have been brewing for many years. 
Capitol Lake was once a popular place to swim. In the 1980s, the historic swimming beach was closed because of water quality impairments related to bacteria and reduced water clarity. And still today, the water body and the project area is in violation of state and federal water quality standards. Water skiers and hydrofoils once skipped across the water at the foot of the state capitol. But not anymore. Over the years, the lake has collected several invasive species, including plants like Eurasian milfoil. The discovery of tiny New Zealand mud snails in 2009 led to a ban on any activity that involves touching the water at Capitol Lake. Which means that the community can't use this resource here. Basically, anything that touches the water is a potential vector for spreading New Zealand mud snails. So Jesse Schultz is the lead prevention biologist keeping tabs on Capitol Lake for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Aquatic Species Unit. The New Zealand mud snail is one of the most effective invasive species as an invader because they are tiny. The adults are about one eighth of an inch. Signs at Capitol Lake warn visitors about the risk of accidentally transporting the mud snails to other places. They can hitch a ride on a dog's paw or hide in the mud wedged between boot treads. And if they were on a boot, they could survive possibly up to 30 days. According to Schultz, there are limited options for dealing with the mud snails. We definitely could kill them, but then we would probably kill everything else in the water body. So our approach right now is we want to contain them. They're all clones of each other, so they're born with their embryos right when they're born. So all it takes is one New Zealand mud snail on somebody's boot or kayak and then go to a different water body and that potentially could infest that water body. So that's what makes them so dangerous. Although swimming, boating and fishing are no longer allowed, Capitol Lake remains very popular for the space and the scenery it offers. It backs up to the West Bay of Bud Inlet in the heart of downtown Olympia. Public and private investments have transformed this part of the city into a popular pedestrian waterfront with boardwalks, pavilions, shops and restaurants concentrated within a few blocks of the lake. People come to spot wildlife such as birds, seals, and otters. And there's plenty of parking. The future for this area may look very different, more like the past. For years, a group of stakeholders from state, tribal, and local governments have been reviewing different options for the future of the lake. The list included a managed lake, which wouldn't change the scenery at all a hybrid lake estuary with a free-flowing river and a separate reflecting pool. And the third alternative, to restore the Deschutes estuary by removing the dam and reconnecting the freshwater river to the saltwater sound. In 2022, the Department of Enterprise Services, which manages the lake, approved a permanent change of scenery. DES has endorsed a plan to return the waterway to its natural state. The rebirth of the Deschutes estuary means the end of Capitol Lake. We understand that there are feelings on both sides and maybe everyone won't be satisfied with the decision, but we're making it, taking everything into consideration. Carrie Martin and Tessa Gardner-Brown are co-leaders for the long-term planning project. Martin is the project manager for the state and Gardner-Brown is the project lead for the environmental consulting firm hired to study the options. So when we started this process, we convened the local stakeholders, our local and tribal government partners together and developed work groups and came up with what do we all agree on? And we all agreed on four main project goals that water quality needs to improve, that um, we need to manage sediment accumulation and future deposition of that sediment we need to improve the ecological functions of the water body, and we need to restore community use. Largely, there is agreement on those goals. So regardless of what you think um, this should look like in the future, um, everyone agrees that they want those four goals, and the way to get that is to move forward.
What we saw was that on average, over the course of the year, about 80% of the time, there would be some level of water in the North Basin over the tidal flats. Since the dam was constructed in 1951, within about two decades, there were visible impairments within the water body. From the beginning, sedimentation has been a key problem for Capitol Lake. The lake receives a steady stream of silt from the Deschutes River, most of which is held in by the dam. 35,000 cubic yards of sediment that are transported from the Deschutes River and Percival Creek into the project area every year. It's difficult to visualize how much material is flowing into Capitol Lake because it's happening underwater. On dry land, 35,000 cubic yards of soil could reportedly cover a city block with three feet of dirt. What that's done over the course of time is resulted in sediment deposition up to 13 feet thick in some areas throughout the basin. Capital Lake, one of the state's most versatile and valuable resources, can be saved. The state commission film from the 1970s illustrates just how long the state has been working on sediment control strategies for Capitol Lake. In the Middle Basin, another sediment trap could be made by excavating a part of the lake bottom just north of the freeway bridge. Most of the silt and sand escaping through the first settling basin would stop here. Several decades later, the sediment problem has only gotten worse. Capitol Lake gets a little shallower each year and will eventually fill in completely without intervention. The lake hasn't been dredged since 1986. The managing agency says its dredge permit requests weren't viable until now. We haven't been able to do anything in the lake, not even short-term actions like maintenance dredging. Those can't happen until we've completed the EIS and until we have a long-term management plan in place. And so that's what this process gets us to. We get those in place. Estuary proponents say allowing salt water to flush the basin and change the water level could reduce the presence of invasive species like the tiny mud snails. Project directors say some of the lost on water recreational opportunities might be restored in an estuary setting through the use of decontamination stations. From the very beginning, that's been one of the primary project goals is to restore community use of this resource. Uh, it's part of the Capitol campus and it's an incredible resource and we want people to be able to use it, not just to walk and bike around it on the trails, but to get over the water on the new boardwalks and to fish and to boat, non-motorized boating. So yes, that's the intent, that's the goal, and we certainly want people to be able to use this resource again. In announcing its selection, the agency, DES, said the estuary alternative is the only option that could allow the impacted waterways to meet state water quality standards. The environmental report for the project also concluded that converting the freshwater lake to a brackish estuary would have clear benefits for salmon in the Deschutes and ease the saltwater transition during migration. Our fishermen do still um, practice their treaty rights in the Butt Inlet area. Chairman Chris Peters of the Squaxin Island Tribe represents the stakeholders with the longest ties to the region. Christopher Klopsch Peters, chairman of the Squaxin Island Tribe. The tribe has been pushing to restore the estuary for many years. And that goes back 200 years and thousands of years before that when my ancestors uh, lived right there on the shores of the Deschutes River and along the shores of Bud Inlet and uh, what is now Olympia. Uh, what we call the Stuchos, named after the band of people who lived there, um, which I'm directly related to. And they lived in a natural habitat where there was year-round salmon, uh, there was game, there was a natural environment, um, and they lived in an area where they were quite wealthy because of the abundance. And by putting that dam in there, it essentially destroyed the natural habitat and is perpetuating the death of our salmon, which is going extinct everywhere, uh, but this is another area in which it's, it's perpetuating that. And so it's incredibly important to us. The community is still divided about the prospect of trading the lake for an estuary and what that would mean for the people who live in the area, the businesses that thrive on downtown visitors, and the aesthetic appeal of the state capital.
Oh, I talk about it. Yes, all of my friends, everybody I meet, we talk about the lake or the implications of what's to come. The estuary restoration plan involves creating a 500 foot wide opening where the Fifth Avenue Dam currently sits and allowing the water level in the Deschutes Basin to rise and fall with the tides. Removing the dam without losing major transportation, recreation, and economic resources will require building a new Fifth Avenue bridge, realigning other roads, constructing a new network of boardwalks, and taking a much more active approach to managing sediment. Without the dam holding it back, silt from the Deschutes will be deposited in the bay. More frequent dredging will be necessary to prevent it from filling in the boat slips at Olympia's marinas, the port of Olympia's berths, and making the federal navigation channel too shallow. We're really worried about the amount of sediment that could come out of the lake and what that would mean for the future ex existence of OIC. Because of its proximity to the Fifth Avenue Dam, the Olympia Yacht Club is projected to see more sediment accumulation and changes in water depth than the other affected boat yards. We think the state's estimates are, are quite low on the cost, but if you look at all of the sediment that we think could come out of the lake by the year 2050 and the corresponding um, dredging cost with that, our calculations show that it could be upwards of $150 million to dredge all of West Bay to keep the status quo that we have right now. At Olympia City Hall, elected leaders have embraced the proposed transition at Capitol Lake. Well, a year ago, the city council took a stance and we put forward a resolution in support of the estuary option. So the city council and our staff are all aligned in that direction. And so Olympia Mayor Cheryl Selby thinks it's a big opportunity for the city as well as the environment. I don't know of another city with the same circumstances as this. That doesn't mean there isn't another city out there that's moving forward with you know, restoring uh, an estuarian, estuarian uh, habitat. And that's what we're going to have right in our downtown. I mean, it's going to be a huge draw for tourism. And, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, right? It took 60 years to get to this point. It might take that long to get it back to what it was before. Uh, but it will happen. It's a done deal in the minds of a select few of people. Uh, uh, you know, the city council, uh, the staff of the uh, draft EIS, but until they come up with the $500 million, who's going to pay for it? Bob yeah. Wobana is the former owner and founder of Fiddlehead Marina in Olympia. He's a retired environmental engineer and a member of CLIPA, the Capital Lake Improvement and Protection Association, a group set up to preserve Capital Lake. We have for 15 years said that the uh, lake actually provides more environmental benefit to the waterfront and to the watershed and to the Puget Sound than a, a terminal urban uh, estuary, which this would be. Wobbena says the group has commissioned its own studies which conflict with the state's position on Capitol Lake and water quality problems. They claim that lake is sick because it's got the growth on it. Most of that growth is actually good growth and, and it's removing the nitrogen. So you're gonna have a mud flat all over Capitol Lake. The base Another study focused on the invasive New Zealand mud snails. Wobbena questions why the state quarantined Capitol Lake, but not the other state waterways where the snails have been found, like the Columbia River, Lake Washington, or the Chehalis River. So they shut Capitol Lake down, but they haven't done it with the rest of them, including on the Chehalis River, which is only a few miles from here. Some critics of the estuary plan raise concerns about the possibility of invasive snails spreading into the Puget Sound if the dam is removed. Some studies have shown the snails can adapt to saltier water over time and have colonized the mouth of the Columbia River. The environmental impact statement for this project says that's unlikely to happen in Bud Inlet. Aquatic invasive species expert Jesse Schultz says the snails have had ample opportunity to spread into the bay adjacent to Capitol Lake when the tide gates have been opened at various times. The freshwater side of the dam has some of the highest concentrations of New Zealand mud snails in Capitol Lake. As far as Capitol Lake goes, we've conducted surveys just on the other side of the dam in the salt water, and we have never found New Zealand mud snails there. Jeff Dickerson with the Squaxin Island Tribe's Natural Resources Department disputes any suggestion that Capitol Lake could be beneficial to water quality in the sound. 
There's no argument to suggest that the lake would somehow improve the conditions. The estuary would significantly improve water quality. There are constant water quality standard violations in Bud Inlet and in fact here in the freshwater. And uh, obviously the freshwater ones would go away because it would be marine water but restoration of the estuary would help to contain and control the invasive species. Dickinson is confident the estuary would be better for the salmon born upstream than the current dynamic in Capitol Lake. The removal of the dam and elimination of that fish ladder would eliminate a choke point for salmon passing through and into the Deschutes River system. That makes them very vulnerable to predation by marine mammals at that point. And then there's also the effect of, uh, on the, the younger fish as they try to survive the gauntlet and migrate out to sea. Many of Washington's salmon runs are struggling. State, local, and tribal governments have invested billions of dollars in habitat recovery and fish passage improvement projects to give endangered salmon a better shot. The Deschutes hatchery salmon are Chinook, also known as king salmon. They are the largest type of Pacific salmon and the main source of food for the Northwest's beloved but endangered killer whales, the iconic southern resident orcas. The potentially huge change for the state capitol reflects a broader debate which is playing out across Washington. Several years ago, the largest dam breach in U.S. history took place in Olympic National Park on the Elwha River. The highly publicized Snake River Dams discussion involves deep disagreements over the costs and benefits of maintaining the four lower Snake River Dams for irrigation, crop transportation, and hydropower against the backdrop of struggling wild salmon runs and the growing demand for clean energy. If state leaders approve a radical change for the state capital itself, the decision may have ramifications far beyond Olympia. Those other dams, albeit I'm very supportive of taking them down, but you look at the argument for keeping them up, people, well, there's power, right? Or there is a use for them. The difference between this one and why I'd be embarrassed if I were the state of Washington is this dam has no function. It doesn't create jobs. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't create power. There's, there's really no function to it except to create a pond um, that was man-made. And what it is doing at the same time is it's destroying habitat and creating uh, pollution. Uh, you're not even allowed to let your dog swim in that lake. Um, so we are creating this area that is essentially, um, really, there's no good that comes out of it at all. I think our stakeholders in the community agree they want to see something happen and no action doesn't work anymore. I'm worried about the price of the project and how is that going to impact the businesses there on the bay and the harbor. This thing has been under construction over and over again and it makes it very difficult to live on the west side of town. And how many years is that going to go on which is really a drag. I, I'm concerned to lose the beauty of the lake. It's the right thing to do for clean water for our Puget Sound. The aesthetics, it's, you know, it's like, that's a personal thing. It's like what looks pretty to some person might not look attractive to another person. And so I just really want to assure people that this wasn't a knee-jerk reaction. It's been 40 years that we've been studying it. And so we're finally at that point where we have this decision. We are really just trying to make sure that we can survive. Um, OIC has been a part of the Olympia community for 118 years. This project could put the um, economic vibrance of the waterfront at risk. This is a recreational paradise down here. So the question is, what are those people going to do? You know, the terminology, uh, estuaries are better. Most estuaries are better, not all estuaries are better. And so what our frustration over the last 15 years was getting an honest dialogue going on about what are the pros and cons of each of the alternatives, and that just never happened. We understand that a vibrant city and, and a well-maintained economy is important for all of us. It's good for everyone, including the tribe. So we don't want that to go away, and we want the yacht club and, and all those docks and those marinas to be sustainable. So there's ways around that, and we want to help with that. 
If you wanna, if you're looking for beauty, if that's your only argument for the lake, boy, we can help you make an incredibly gorgeous estuary in there that is so pretty and maintained and an opportunity to educate people on how to actually um, enhance the environment as opposed to take from it.